Uh, hello class. So today um, we're going to cover transcription and splicing. This is uh, lecture eight. Um, so to give you guys some quick background and, uh, and review, uh, you, you all know that the central dogma um, is DNA to RNA to protein. Um, and the first step in the central dogma transcription is going from DNA to RNA. Um, and what transcription is really doing is taking all of the genetic information um, in DNA and cre converting it into a more usable form, right? And so transcription produces RNA. If the transcript encodes a protein, um, it's called a messenger RNA, okay? And there's many different kinds of RNAs, um, and what we're going to focus mostly on today are the messenger RNAs. Um, and something that you guys all have to keep in mind is that transcription in general is a highly regulated process. And in the second uh, third of this course, we're actually going to be covering a lot on transcriptional regulation. So everything we cover today, um, you'll need uh, for when we build on that um, in a couple weeks. Um, so here's the central dogma first proposed by um, Francis Crick, okay? It's very simple, DNA to RNA to protein. Um, and we've already covered DNA replication and repair and recombination. Um, and so today we're gonna look at RNA synthesis or transcription. Um, and then uh, next week or next lecture, we'll actually cover translation or protein synthesis. Okay, so one of the things you need to know is transcription is a very highly regulated process. Translation is also regulated, um, but really the vast majority of the regulation um, really comes in at the level of transcription. Um, here's a little schematic of just a fraction of the human uh, X chromosome, um, and this showing all of the genes the tall gray bars are actually exons, while the sort of smaller gray bars um, sort of connecting them, the darker shaded uh, brown are introns. Okay, uh, and you have the gene names up here, um, and shown in red here are, um, are basically uh, genes that give rise to certain diseases. Okay, so hemophilia, um, incognita pigmentia. Um, there's also a gene right here, MECP2, um, which also gives rise to this uh, syndrome called Rett syndrome, which uh, a lot of the graduate students will come across. Um, and so, you know, this is basically just a schematic. The blue here shows uh, how highly conserved it is, and you can see in the protein coding regions, um, the exons, uh, the, the DNA is, is much more conserved across species. Um, and so this is just to give you an idea of how complex the gene, our genome is, and also what the cells have to go through to determine what are the appropriate sequences to actually transcribe out of the vast array of DNA that's there, right? You can just see this is just 5% of the human X chromosome, and these are all of the genes. And so it's really important for the cell to be able to figure out what it wants to uh, uh, transcribe so that that can be translated into a functional form in the case, in some cases, with a protein. Um, some other things that are shown on here are some non-coding RNAs, um, the SN uh, SNOR70 and um, SNOR-A36 and SNOR-A36. 56, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. There's also um, microRNAs on here somewhere where um, uh, I can't seem to find them. Oh, up here, uh, here's a couple of microRNAs. They're often abbreviated MIRs, so MIR 718. Um, and these uh, transcripts that arise uh, from these, they're non-coding RNAs, and they have other functions that we'll look at later on in the term. Um, but in its most uh, simplified form, when you have transcription and translation, what you'll have is gene A, and then that's transcriptionally regulated, okay, producing multiple RNAs. And then you have translational regulation, and a, a bunch of RNAs can give rise to a, a bunch of proteins. Um, likewise, you can have sort of lower regulated genes, like in the case with gene B, where you just produce a small amount of RNA, and then also that's sort of regulated to the point where you're only producing a small amount of protein. Okay, so regulated transcription and translation are just really important for the cell. 
Okay. Um, let's look a little bit at uh, RNA just in general, so ribonucleic acids. Um, they're composed of four bases, A, G, C, and U, um, where basically uracil is replacing the thymine and DNA. Okay, um, the big difference in the ribose group um, is that in RNA you just have the ribose with the OH here, and in DNA it's um, deoxyribose. Um, this is the structure. Um, once again, it's connected by a phospho, um, uh, phosphodiester bond, and here are the various bases. Um, now, uracil is uh, used in place of thymine, um, and you can see that it actually can base pair with adenine. All right, just like T could base pair um, with adenine as well. Um, I'm sure you guys have all had this uh, um, in your class. Now, RNA is, um, is single-stranded, and because these bases all like to base pair, just like DNA, RNA oftentimes will take on a secondary structure where you have hydrogen bonding between a lot of the bases. Um, and we'll see this again when we come across the ribosomal RNAs um, as well as tRNAs and all of the other RNAs. So in general, RNAs like to um, base pair and hydrogen bond um, among itself, um, uh, basically, and then, you know, and this causes the RNAs to have um, both a secondary and a tertiary structure. Okay, so here would be the secondary structure and here um, is the tertiary structure. And you can see that A's base pair with U's um, and G's still base pair with C's. Um, now, like we saw with DNA replication, um, transcription is also read off a template strand, right? Um, and so the template strand uh, goes from the three prime to five prime, and the transcription or the transcription proceeds from the five prime to the three prime end. Okay, so RNA is created in almost the same way as the DNA is created, right? In the five prime to three prime direction. The enzyme that basically converts the DNA into RNA um, is called RNA polymerase. And here's just a schematic of RNA polymerase. You can see the direction that it's moving is um, off to the right here. Um, the mRNA uh, will actually exit, or the RNA will actually exit an RNA channel. Here's the active site where you're basically um, complementary base pairing with the DNA um, as it's being read and the bases are being um, added. There's also a, a ribonucleoside um, triphosphate uptake channel that brings in the, the ribonucleoside triphosphates. Um, here's a space filling molecule, a uh, space filling model of um, RNA polymerase, and here you can see the, the double stranded DNA. Um, one of the strands is actually displaced uh, as the mRNA is being sort of copied, and you can sort of appreciate that from what we looked at when we were looking at DNA polymerase, where you actually have to complementary base pair the proper RNA in place um, as the phosphodiester bond in the mRNA is being um, catalyzed, right? Um, and here comes out, here is your newly transcribed um, RNA transcript. And you have the exit path for the double helix and the entrance path for it. Um, here's a great electron micrograph of transcription. Um, this is actually a, a picture of ribosomal DNA being transcribed to make ribosomal RNA or, R, or rRNA. And you can see that the um, polymerase is actually making a ton of RNA um, as it's sort of moving down and the RNA is sort of sticking off uh, in these little hairs here. Um, and what's interesting is that Ribosomal RNA basically makes up greater than 90% of all of the RNA in a cell. Um, and for those of you that want just a sort of little interesting tidbit, uh, the ribosomal DNA um, in our genomes is actually methylated. Um, and it's sort of widely thought that methylated DNA serves as a mark for silencing, but in this case it's the most highly transcribed region. Um, sort of just a uh, interesting little fact um, with that, uh, but um, okay. So here's basically the core of the um, 
RNA polymerase. Turns out the structure is a double side barrel. So here's just like an ancient double side barrel um, and it comes together and then, you know, some of the amino acids in the active site um, uh, were changed to aspartic acids and lysines. Okay, and so this is where the active site um, there's also a central magnesium that's present, and we'll see that in a second um, as we look at the structure again. Um, so here are some of the different types of RNAs that are produced by a cell. Um, we've sort of talked about messenger RNAs. These are the mRNA, These are the RNAs that code for protein. Um, they're ribosomal RNAs, and these sort of form the basis structure of the ribosome, um, which we'll look at and talk about next uh, lecture. Um, there's also tRNAs. These are transfer RNAs, and these are very important in protein synthesis, and we'll see them um, in the next lecture as well. Um, and then you have a whole bunch of other uh, sort of small um, RNAs. Um, some are small nuclear RNAs, and then there's small nucleolar RNAs. Um, these are oftentimes involved in processing the ribosomal RNAs. Um, you have these uh, small cagel RNAs. Um, microRNAs. These uh, microRNAs, as we'll see in a couple lectures, they're involved in um, post-translational regulation of mRNA. Um, and then there's siRNAs, um, which uh, we sort of saw with RNAi-mediated heterochromatin. Um, and then there's other long non-coding RNAs that have a whole bunch of diverse, diverse functions. There's actually a non-coding RNA that originates from the telomeres called Tara. Um, there's a couple of non-coding RNAs that are involved in X chromosome and activation, Xist um, and uh, Psi-X. Um, and then there's a, also a whole other class of proteins, They're just plain old long intergenic RNAs, um, natural antisense transcript, dicer-independent siRNAs, um, there's eRNAs, which are enhancer RNAs, and then there's um, these things called nanoRNAs. So here's a basic outline of the transcription cycle, and this is actually in bacteria. Um, so the big take home for everyone in the class is that there's just sort of three cycles. There's um, an initiation, an elongation phase, and then a termination phase. Okay, so in bacteria, in the case with initiation, fact, um, initiation, what you have is your DNA with a promoter, and the promoter, these two little red boxes here on the promoter, um, are the minus 10 and minus 35 uh, elements, and a sigma factor will bind to them and help to recruit um, the RNA polymerase. Okay, and so once it's recruited and the bubble starts to form, this is when, uh, and it sort of starts its whole um, uh, transcription process, uh, that's called initiation, and here you can see it's just starting to produce um, the messenger RNA. And so once it's produced the messenger RNA, as it's sort of going into full length, um, the sigma factor actually falls off, and then you hit the elongation phase, okay, where it's just going to start producing um, the, uh, the RNA transcript. Okay, and then at termination, the RNA is going to basically be largely complete, and then the RNA polymerase comes off of the DNA and a whole nother round can sort of happen over and over again. And so the important concepts here are in, there's initiation, that's the start of transcription. Elongation is sort of the production phase when it's actually producing the um, RNA. And then there's termination when the uh, transcription cycle stops. Now, in the case with these minus 10 and minus 35 boxes, uh, here's what they look like. There's a consensus sequence for them. Um, you don't need to memorize this. Uh, it's just sort of here to show you. Um, and on average, the minus 10 and minus 35 boxes are on average uh, 17 base pairs apart. Okay, and that's where the sigma factors um, associate. Um, now, RNA polymerase actually has a directionality, okay? It can travel and copy off of either strain, right, or either strand of the DNA, um, and it's always going to use the 3' to 5' prime as the template strand and synthesize in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, 
Okay, and so in this case, if it's if the polymerase is going to the right, it's copying off the three prime strand and it's making um, the five prime to three prime messenger RNA. Um, it can also go on the other strand where it's sort of reading now this top strand from three prime to five prime, and it's producing um, the uh, RNA in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, um, and so in this case, if this was your stretch of DNA. Um, if it's going in the right direction, it would be producing a, a stretch of C's. If it was going to um, the left, it would be producing a stretch of G's. So one of the take-home message here is that the directionality of the polymerase requires that the promoters be oriented so that the polymerase knows the appropriate strand to be reading in the direction that it needs to be traveling in. Okay, um, so here's just a, an example of some E. coli promoters. Um, you know, you have these different genes, um, and here's the DNA of E. coli, and you can see um, RNA transcripts can be produced off either strand. Um, and the bacterial promoters are actually relatively simple. Um, and one other thing that's not shown here is that bacterial genes are often polycystronic, uh, which means that they um, basically have um, many genes on them, um, and i.e. they're sort of um, expressed as operons, which can give rise to many different proteins. Um, and we'll see that in, the, in a slide or two. Um, now, in the case with eukaryotes, there's actually different RNA polymerases. There's RNA polymerase 1, RNA polymerase 2, and RNA polymerase 3. Um, RNA polymerase 1 is basically involved in, in making the ribosomal RNAs. RNA polymerase 2 um, is needed for basically all the protein coding genes, um, a whole bunch of non-coding RNAs like SNOs and mirrors, siRNAs, um, and, and the such. Um, and then there's uh, RNA polymerase 3, which produces things like uh, tRNAs um, and some other um, associated RNAs. Um, so, because RNA Pol2 is used to make most of the RNA, it's, it's also the most studied, and that's the one we're going to actually cover um, the most in this course. Um, and here's the structure of um, both the bacterial RNA polymerase and the sort of eukaryotic Pol2. And um, once again, here's the, the central magnesium, and then there's also zinc molecules associated with it. So you can see when you sort of overlay those two um, polymerases, the bacterial uh, form and the um, sort of eukaryotic form, uh, you can see there's a lot of structural similarities between the two of them. Now, in the case with eukaryotes, um, we don't have sigma factors like bacteria. We have a whole different mechanism that's used to recruit RNA polymerase. Um, and it, it sort of goes um, in sort of a stepwise fashion. Um, and this is really important stuff, and I want you guys to, to know this, so um, pay close attention here. So if you have a um, sort of eukaryotic or mammalian gene, um, one of the things you're going to have is a, what's called a TATA box, um, and then that's sort of upstream of this tart of transcription. So during recruitment of the general transcription factors, okay, that's the GTFs, um, the first thing that happens is this protein called TBP, or TATA binding protein, um, and its partner TF2D um, come and associate with the TATA box, okay? And once they're there, they recruit TF2B, and then once TF2B has come in, then all of a sudden you, uh, you can start to recruit TF2E and TF2H, and TF2H is actually a DNA helicase um, that helps to start unwind the DNA, and then uh, RNA polymerase 2, or POL2, and TF2F come in, um, and then the helicase activity actually opens up uh, the DNA for the polymerase, and then you get phosphorylation of the CTD tail. Okay, this is the C-terminal domain um, of RNA polymerase, and it gets phosphorylated, um, and so that's when transcription is initiated. Okay, and we'll look at phosphorylation of the CTD tail um, a lot further in a, in a couple slides. Um, so once again, um, sort of know the order of the recruitment of the general transcription factors and, and 
um, RNA polymerase because these will get recruited and sometimes they'll be poised on a promoter um, for expression, which we'll cover when we look at transcriptional regulation um, more in the sort of second part of the term here. Um, okay, so here are the general transcription factors and what they do. Um, some of the big ones that you need to know is TBP, uh, which is the TATA binding protein, um, and then TA TAF uh, subunits, uh, there's actually 11 of them, all part of TF2D. Um, these recognize other DNA sequences, um, and TF2B recognizes the Brie element. Um, it's not super important that you know exactly where all of these things are binding, except for TBP, um, to know that TBP recognizes the TATA box. Okay, and also you should know that um, TF2H um, unwinds the DNA, right? It's the, it's the helicase, um, and it phosphorylates the, the serine on the CTD tail, okay? Um, so here's just sort of a consensus sequence for the, the start of transcription. You have your TATA box and your Brie sequence, and also your DPE um, sequence, and here's the general transcription factors that bind at those various locations. Um, Here's actually a, um, a model of TBP bound to DNA, so the crystal structure of um, uh, TBP, and here you can see the TATA box um, that's bound here. Okay, so it binds, it creates a nice little kink in the DNA. Um, but there's a little bit more to it. So here you have your general transcription factors um, bound to DNA, and you, know, you have your, your TATA box here shown in green, uh, the red is the start of transcription, um, but then you have enhancer elements and activator proteins that are bound to enhancer elements. And then there's this large complex called mediator um, that sort of sits and associates the general transcription factors with the um, transcriptional activators or the enhancer proteins. Okay, there's also histone modifying enzymes and chromatin remodeling complexes that sort of all sit down, um, and this is sort of the pre-initiation complex where now all of a sudden the activation can occur um, and you can go from initiation to elongation. Now, one of the things that happens when, um, when you're transcribing DNA, and we saw this pretty much with um, when you were copying DNA, um, is that when you just unwind one, the 10 base pairs of DNA, that, that actually equals one helical turn. And that causes super helical tension um, on, the, uh, on the DNA. And this um, tension actually has to be um, alleviated. Okay, and as the polymerase is traveling down, it's going to even create more sort of, um, you know, supercoils. And these supercoils are actually repressive um, on DNA. If you're making too many of them, um, you know, the, it makes it that much more difficult for the polymerase uh, to travel through. And so just like with DNA, um, you know, you can have, or, you know, a protein molecule, and as it's moving, ahead of the polymerase, you're getting positive supercoiling, and behind the um, d behind the DNA, you're getting negative supercoiling. Okay, and just like with uh, DNA replication, the enzyme topoisomerase helps to alleviate the positive supercoiling um, that's caused by RNA polymerase. Um, in bacteria, for those of you who care, it's an enzyme called DNA gyrase. Um, but what's kind of neat about this is actually the, um, the toporisomerase can actually, you know, indirectly um, control transcription because if these positive supercoils are not alleviated, that actually sort of helps to slow down transcription. Um, okay, so um, this is somewhat of an important slide, and I want you guys to really appreciate the difference between um, transcription in eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. So in prokaryotes, it's really simple. You know, they, they have just a shared cytoplasm where the DNA and the mRNA are all present, and so you have, tran you have transcription and translation um, in the cytosol, and that's all there is to it. And there's nothing fancy with the messenger RNA um, or, you know, and the protein is just translated. In the case with eukaryotes, it's a little more complicated, right, because um, 
first of all, eukaryotes have oftentimes have introns and exons, okay, and then transcription actually or the primary transcript will include both all of the exons and the introns. Okay, and then this primary transcript is then processed. And there's a number of processing events that happen. Um, the five prime end of the messenger RNA gets capped. There's RNA splicing. And then the three prime end of the messenger RNA gets, oftentimes gets a poly A tail. Um, there are a few exceptions when it doesn't, but most all mRNA transcripts get a poly A tail added. And then this is all processed in the nucleus. Um, and then there's a regulate, regulated nuclear export event where the mRNA is shuttled into um, the cytoplasm where, uh, where it's then translated on a ribosome. Okay, so it's important that you sort of appreciate the difference between what's happening with eukaryotes um, and what's happening with prokaryotes. Um, so here's uh, another example of the differences. So here you have a prokaryotic mRNA. Um, it doesn't have a five prime cap. It's polycystronic, so it makes an operon, and so the um, and there's no splicing, and so you just have your coding sequence. And in the case with a prokaryotic RNA that's an operon, um, it can give rise to multiple different proteins. Okay, as the ribosome is is translating this. Um, in the case with eukaryotic RNAs, um, by and large, they just make a single protein. They contain a five prime cap. Um, they contain also a five prime and a three prime untranslated region, or five prime UTR and three prime UTR. Um, and then there's the protein coding uh, sequence that gives rise to the protein. And then there's also the poly A tail on the end. So here's uh, what the what the five prime cap looks like. It's actually a five prime seven methyl guanosine cap. Okay, so you've got a methyl group added to uh, the guanosine here on the, um, and uh, here is your primary transcript of the mRNA, and it's sort of connected by this uh, triphosphate bridge here. All right, so here you have your seven, meth seven methyl guanosine onto the five prime end of your primary transcript. Um, and the cap here actually helps um, with the export of mRNA out of the nucleus, okay, and also with translational initiation. So the cap is actually very important in eukaryotes. Um, another very important part is this concept of the CTD tail, okay. This is the C-terminal domain of the RNA polymerase. It's composed of a heptad repeat of seven amino acids, um, and it turns out that there's two serines in it, serine five in the repeat. So uh, there's serine two, serine five. And as you go from initiation to elongation to termination, the state of phosphorylation on the CTD tail changes. Okay, so at initiation, the serine 5 is phosphorylated, and that helps to re recruit the capping factors, right? These are going to put the 7 um, methyl guanosine cap on the messenger RNA, okay? And as you get into um, sort of elongation, both serine 2 and serine 5 are phosphorylated, and these recruit some of the splicing factors to the messenger RNA. And then when you get near termination, uh, the serine 5 is removed, and you're basically left with serine 2 phosphorylation, and that recruits the um, three prime processing proteins, so the proteins that will process the three prime end of the messenger RNA. Okay, so it's really important that you guys know um, how this changes in a eukaryotic cell as it goes from initiation to elongation to termination and how you can tell the difference um, in it. Um, here's the chemistry of how the, the five prime cap is actually added. Um, what you have is your primary transcript um, or your nascent RN, mRNA transcript um, and then a phosphate is removed from the five prime end and then uh, GMP is actually added in reverse and a pyrophosphate is released. Um, and then you have a methyl group that's added to uh, the guanosine um, 
and then you can also get an additional methyl group added but really just um, you, all you need to know is you can take it to here okay so the methyl transferase adds the three prime the the methyl group to the guanosine um, and so in the next part of the court in the next part of the lecture we're actually going to look at the splicing um, as well as some of the termination um, that happens but what you need to really know is that, that these phosphate changes, um, and it's also important to know the recruitment of all the general transcription factors that are happening, um, and then as well as a lot of the basics um, behind uh, the differences that are occurring in, in different cells, and, and just overall what's going on in the whole transcriptional regulation process. Okay, so that's it for Part A, um, and I will pick up Part B in just a second.